And we are joined now by Congressman Himes. Good to see you back here on the program. Great to be back, Dennis. I know it's been a busy year for, your, uh, for, you, know, for you. You've been working a little bit on the Boston Marathon bombings in terms of the Intelligence Committee. Tell me what you can, what we don't know. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, uh, two months ago I was put on the Intelligence Committee, which of course is giving me now a whole bunch of new access to the kinds of things that come up when there's been a terrorist attack and whatnot. And, uh, you know, let, let, let me characterize it for sort of big picture. You know, people always ask me, uh, you know, are you horrified by what you see? And, you know, I, I, obviously I, I hear more about the kinds of things that are being planned against this country, but I also hear more in more detail about the efforts that we have taken to degrade Al Qaeda around the world, uh, the extent to which we've got eyes and ears in some pretty unusual places. And so while maybe I have a better appreciation for some of the threats out there, it's also remarkable to learn about what our capabilities are against some of those threats. There's been some criticism of the FBI that perhaps they should have seen these guys coming. They had been warned by Russia. What do you think Congress will do about that? Will there be any type of investigation or anything like that? Uh, there will certainly be hearings, including in my committee and, and whatnot. And look, anytime something like this happens, you want to do uh, uh, you want to sort of do uh, some backward-looking work to see whether you could have done stuff better. Look, I think the case against the FBI, and you know, you had Lindsey Graham out there saying there was a system failure here. Uh, the Russians let the FBI know that this was a person of concern. They went to Boston. They interviewed him. They interviewed his family. They looked at his you know usage of the websites and this, that, and the other thing. Look, at the time, he hadn't done anything, so it's not like the FBI. Could hang around forever. So I think a little bit of that criticism is, is is a bit unfair. There were some things that we need to look into, though. I mean, you know, uh, the CIA uh, got notification from the Russians that this guy was of concern. There are questions about whether the FBI and the CIA uh, coordinated that uh, that thinking as well as they should have. And then, of course, he left the country. He went to Russia and came back. And there was a glitch there. Some people who probably should have known that he was traveling to Russia didn't know that as a result of a misspelled name or something. So again, I, I think there's some details that need to be explained and we all need to learn from this, but you know, I, I, I've never been a believer that as some of the senators have said that there was a massive, massive system failure here. Let's talk about the sequester a little bit. I know you've been around your district this week and one person complained to you about it and you said, well, there could, there could be more pain down the road what, in terms of the sequester. What kind of things are we going to see? Well, not there could be, there will be. Uh, you know, when you all of a sudden... <laughs> Unavoidable. Look, when you do across the board cuts that way, and that means you're cutting good programs as well as bad, good ideas as well as bad ideas, um, everybody's going to feel it. And, uh, you know, we saw it, of course, with the FAA already backing up uh, flight delays, and for better or for worse, very controversial thing, Congress took some action uh, to allow that pressure to, uh, to be released. But, uh, look, you know, as we get into the summer, people are going to sign up for Head Start programs in our cities, and they're going to find that there's not as many Head Start places as, uh, as, there, as there were before. Courts are going to back up, federal courts. Uh, uh, transportation projects, which are pretty important to the state of Connecticut, are going to be delayed. We're going to see more and more of this. The pressure will mount. And of course, remember, that's what the sequester was designed to do, to force the Congress to finally act. What's the way out of this? Well, the, the way out of this, I think, Dennis, comes in the summertime, when not necessarily because the pressure from the sequester builds, though it will, but because we, uh, at the end of May, hit the debt limit ceiling. Um, that needs to be renegotiated. Uh, and, you know, the president has said that he will not negotiate on that basis. I think he's right about that. The debt ceiling is something too serious and too potentially damaging to be used as a negotiating chip. But um, there will be a negotiation this summer. That negotiation is our chance to recalibrate, uh, change, reverse the sequester, and then to do the other things that we know we need to do. Continue the work of getting our, of, of getting our budget in order. Do some uh, fair and equitable reform of programs like uh, Medicare care and social security uh, and and hopefully finish the process of getting our budgets where they need to be uh, so that they're sustainable in the long run speaking of the president you recently were quoted as saying that he could have done more to get gun control passed maybe been a little bit more forceful how so well I you know I'm always hesitant to second guess rooms that I wasn't in but I will tell you that uh, uh, um, that the failure of the universal background check legislation in the Senate, and by the way, the failure with a majority of senators, 54 to 46, it didn't pass, uh, um, was, a, was, a, was a personally uh, very, very uh, distressing thing for me, uh, mainly because there's just no good argument against why, you know, against checking out everybody who buys a gun. You know, fine, go out and, and buy as many guns as you want. We need to check you out to make sure you weren't a, a, a violent offender or a terrorist. Uh, could the president have done more? I mean, could he have had, uh, you know, two or three Democratic senators into the Oval Office and, you know, asked personally and said, I need you to do this. My suspicion is that he probably could have used the power of his office a bit more. In your opinion, do you think Majority Leader Reid could do more? He comes from a pro-gun state. 
Yeah, he, he uh, you know, he's always been uh, hesitant to take up uh, to take up gun safety. And again, I, I, I know I watched less what Harry Reid did than what the president did. So, so I'm not going to second guess him uh, either. But to say that, look, something like universal background check, we, we, we can argue, and I will happily argue about what an assault weapon is and what it is not, about how many rounds should be in a magazine. That's all fair game for discussion. There is no principled reason why we shouldn't be checking out everybody who buys a gun in this country regardless of where they buy it so my hope is that those guys continue to keep the pressure up we're going to see more pressure by the way from people like michael bloomberg and others and that we get a different vote somewhere down the road let's talk about immigration and you have said that we're fairly close to a deal what will it entail yeah yeah so you know the senate is going to take up what i think is a pretty good and pretty balanced uh, uh bill next week um, it contains money for further border security, which is important. It contains uh, better tools for employers to know whether the people they are hiring are legally uh, allowed to work in this country. And importantly, it contains what has been known for a long time as an earned path to citizenship. Stay out of trouble with the law, stay employed, pay your taxes, learn English, pay a very substantial fine. Ten years from now, you get to sign up for a green card. Uh, it's a, I think that's an important mechanism, and, and I'm excited about it. There's not a lot of things I can convey optimism on out of, the, out of Capitol Hill these days, but I actually think this deal is going to get done, and it's going to be good not just for uh, immigration. It's going to be good for Social Security. We're going to have a lot more people paying FICA, uh, and that's going to help us with our Social Security issue. It's going to be good for entrepreneurs who are looking to hire engineers. I, I think I think this deal has the potential to be a real win-win. Do you support driver's licenses for undocumented? Well, this is, a, this is a state issue, right? So it's not something I spend a ton of time on. But particularly if we're going to give people a path to ultimately get a green card, it makes no sense not to let them get a driver's license. Remember, Dennis, and this is important, um, in that 10-year period, these people who have signed up for this program will not be able to get any federal benefits, whether we're talking about welfare or Pell Grants or other federal benefits. But it does seem to me that if they're going to be functional members of our society, Society, they're going to need a driver's license. Uh, should they be able to serve on commissions and boards and things like that? No, I don't know. Now you know. Now, look, I, I, we, we, we will think about these people differently once we acknowledge that they're here, that they're here in a dignified way, and that someday they may, if they stay employed and pay taxes and all that other stuff, be citizens. Why would you say you can't be on the local water board? Uh, you know, I, so, so, so again, I think as we begin to think about these undocumented folks differently, we'll be more welcoming to the idea that they're full members of our society. I want to talk about the biggest city in your district, and it's Bridgeport. It's still hurting economically, still has some problems. What ideas do you have for improving that city? Biggest in the state. Well, you know, uh, in Bridgeport, we uh, we need a whole bunch of things at once, right? We need um, the kind of economic development that will bring businesses into Bridgeport, and I'm delighted to say that this month we will be breaking ground in Steel Point. This is a project of old brownfields down by the water that has been dormant forever, and we'll be breaking ground with some federal money, Tiger Grants, um, to put in place the roads and the electricity and whatnot that will allow uh, a major retailer, uh, uh, Bass Pro, to open up a store. That store is going to employ an awful lot of people in Bridgeport. Along with that kind of economic development, we need to be thinking about, and this is this is mainly the mayor and the and, and the local uh, city councils and board of education's job. But you know, if you're going to expect a lot of businesses to move in, you're going to improve your schools. So you know, these things working in tandem, I think, will take this city, which you know was a great great city a hundred years ago. You know, produced most of the armaments for World War One. You know, huge industries and whatnot, and and, and put it on a on, on a good course. Twenty years ago, the folks in Bridgeport wanted casino gambling. Now Massachusetts is going to be opening four or five new casinos, and it's expected, I think, millions from Connecticut when they do this. Would you ever support uh, perhaps reopening that deal that they have with Mash and Target and, uh, and the Mohegans and maybe expanding gambling in our state? Uh, you know what I'd much rather see? Uh, before I before I got excited about casinos, which is going to raise all the kinds of issues you have around casinos in places like Atlantic City, or whether they're whether they're on the up and up. By the way, it's going to would dramatically increase the traffic problems down in Fairfield County, where uh, there are already terrible traffic problems. I would get so much more excited for the kind of development we were just talking about. Let's move in some advanced manufacturing companies taking advantage of Housatonic Community College's advanced manufacturing program. Let's get businesses, you know, businesses that are actually you know using engineers, using less skilled. Uh, workers. Let's bring in retail. Let's bring in restaurants. I'd, I'd get an awful lot more excited about that kind of development than I would about casinos.
uh, congressmen and women are always running for re-election. It's impossible. The cycle theory, you have to be in it. And there's some talk that the Republicans would like to see Linda McMahon run for that seat. How would she be as an opponent? <laughs> you know, it would certainly be something uh, I hadn't seen before. Uh, you know, we've obviously watched uh, Linda McMahon run two Senate campaigns, spend $50 million each time. I sort of wonder whether she'd spend a little less for a House seat since it's only a fifth of the state of Connecticut. Um, and and uh, so, you know, it would certainly be something that I haven't seen before. Look, my district is always going to be a challenging district for anybody to hold until uh, five years ago it was held by a Republican, now it's held by a Democrat. That's a good thing. It's always contested. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and second guess who's going to test me, but I, I, you, can, you can count on it happening, and it'll certainly be uh, uh, an, an exciting race. We'll see if, uh, if Linda McMahon decides to, to take a third try at, uh, at federal office. Good enough. All right, Congressman Jim Himes, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thanks, Dennis.